Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Grand Rounds this morning. Uh, before we uh, move ahead with the introduction of our distinguished speaker today, I uh, just have some housekeeping issues um, uh, to mention to all of you. Uh, so if you have any questions throughout the presentation, here on the bottom, uh, there will be a couple of boxes. Uh, I'll ask you to use the Q&A box to ask your questions for the presenter. Uh, as we'll be able to see them on the other end and moderate them for you. Uh, we'll also be accepting live questions at the end of the presentation. So if you prefer to talk about your questions instead of typing it, uh, we just raise your hand. There's a raise hand function that you can um, click here on the bottom as well. And uh, we will then call on you and then you can unmute your phone at the time uh, to ask your questions to our presenter. Uh, okay, if you have any technical issues throughout the presentation, then rather you use the chat button to communicate those uh, those technical questions uh, to us. So without further ado, it is my distinct privilege today to welcome Dr. Harmony Reynolds here to our virtual rounds at the University of Ottawa Heart Institute. Uh, Dr. Reynolds is an Associate Professor of Medicine at the NYU Grossman School of Medicine, where she directs the Sarah Ross Sauter Center for Women's Cardiovascular Research, and she's an Associate Director of the Cardiovascular Clinical Research Center there as well. Dr. Reynolds' research career has been focused on the mechanisms and outcomes of cardiovascular disease in women and testing of treatment strategies for ischemic heart disease in clinical trials. She is particularly well known for her work in myocardial infarction with non-obstructive coronary arteries, also known as MINOCA, and stable ischemic heart disease with non-obstructive coronary arteries, also called INOCA. Dr. Reynolds is the Associate Director of the Clinical Coordinating Center for the NHLBI-funded International Multi-Center Ischemia Trial, which I'm sure all of you are very well familiar with. In addition, she was the principal investigator of the Chow Ischemia Study, an international multi-center NHLBI-funded study researching the relationship between changes in symptoms and changes in stress test results over time in patients with INOCA. She worked with colleagues to report on the relationship between medications and COVID-19 diagnosis and outcomes and the role of microvascular and macrovascular thrombosis in severe or fatal COVID-19, leveraging experience at NYU, NYU uh, Langone Health System in New York City, an early epicenter of this pandemic. She is the co-principal investigator of the active four acute trial of anticoagulation in COVID-19 patients. And Dr. Reynolds' clinical efforts include general cardiology practice at the NYU Langone Health, with focus on cardiovascular disease in women, and supervision of fellows at the Bellevue Hospital Cardiology Clinic. Mm -hmm. She received her medical degree from NYU School of Medicine and completed her training in internal medicine and cardiology at the NYU Bellevue Hospital. She was named one of the AHA Founders Affiliate Rock Star of Research in 2011. And on a more personal note, uh, I have been uh, a personal follower of Dr. Reynolds' uh, work. As you will see today, she has been one of the masterminds of so many of the landmark studies that have helped identify and clarify the pathophysiology and diagnosis of MINOCA. It's a condition that we see more and more. I'm sure all of you have encountered it, and we certainly see a lot of it in our Women's Heart Health Clinic. So it's been truly an honor to be able to have Dr. Reynolds uh, here today, and I can't wait to see what she has to teach us today. So welcome, Dr. Reynolds, on behalf of our team. Thank you so much for that warm introduction. It's a real pleasure to be with you this morning. Let me share my slides. Can you see everything okay? Yes, we can. Great. All right, so let's talk about my favorite topic, the evaluation and management of myocardial infarction with non-obstructive coronary arteries, or MINOCA. What do we mean by this thing? Well, for decades, it's been recognized that angiography may identify no significantly diseased artery in some patients with MI, and that significance threshold is typically set around 50%, but it could be 30% or 70% different authors will occasionally use different thresholds. I think having a common terminology for this thing has been very useful in moving the field forward. It just goes to show you that when we all use the same name for something, it's a lot easier to know what we're talking about. This occurs in 6 to 15 percent of MI cases, and it disproportionately affects women. We estimate the incidence, at least in the U.S., of 50,000 to 100,000 per year of MINOCA. There are now standardized diagnostic criteria for MINOCA. There's a set from the European Society of Cardiology and this set from the American Heart Association. They're quite similar. And they're centered 
on making a diagnosis of acute myocardial infarction according to the universal definition of MI. So there has to be a rise and fall of troponin with at least one value that is abnormal above the 99th percentile reference limit. And there has to be corroborative evidence that this is coming from the heart, whether it's symptoms, EKG changes, new wall motion abnormality, or a new perfusion defect. And of course, it's non-obstructive coronaries, but that encompasses both angiographically normal arteries and those that have some plaque, even all the way up to the 49% uh, stenosis. And when we talk about what Minoka is, we talk a lot about what it isn't. So if you know what the clinical reason is for this presentation of, let's say, chest pain and an elevation in troponin, then it might not be MI. So if there's a sepsis-related troponin, if it's pulmonary embolism, if you know it's myocarditis because you have an 18-year-old man with influenza who has this presentation, for example, then we don't call that Minoka because we wouldn't diagnose it as MI. We use the term Minoka when we really think the patient is having myocardial infarction. Which types of patients get this problem? Well, as I said, it disproportionately affects women. So there are many studies showing this, but here are three of the largest. And whether the presentation is with ST elevation or without, you can see that there is a substantial minority of patients that will have non-obstructive coronary disease. And looking at STEMI, it's 4 to 10% of women and 2 to 8% of men. In non-STEMI, 9 to 15% of women and 4 to 5% of men have no 50% or greater stenosis. We also teamed up with the New York City Chief Medical Examiner's Office and found that even in people who are aged under 55 and had died with myocardial infarction, 23% of the females and 16% of the males had no obstructive coronary disease. So this can present as a fatal problem. Minoka is also more common among certain racial and ethnic minorities, particularly black African patients and Hispanic patients. These data from the Action Get With The Guidelines Registry, now called Chest Pain MI, where we had nearly 19,000 Minoka patients. And from the same study, we see the age structure of the Minoka population. These patients are often young. Fully a quarter of them were aged under 50 at the time of their event, another quarter aged 50 to 59, still another quarter in their 60s. But you can have Minoka at any age. So the typical demographic might be a young female of African descent, but even old white guys get Minoka. And conventional risk factors are common among patients with Minoka. So although the prevalence of risk factors tends to be lower than in people who have more atherosclerosis, still in Minoka patients, you will see 20% diabetes, 65% with hypertension, about half have dyslipidemia, about a quarter are current or recent smokers, and 75% will have at least one coronary disease risk factor. When encountering this problem, clinicians and patients ask, was this really MI? What's the treatment? And what's the prognosis? Let's start with the prognosis. This graph shows a conglomerate of studies in blue documenting the in-hospital and long-term mortality after a Minoka event, and that's compared to U.S. statistics for the general population that's age and sex matched in gray. The in-hospital mortality in several studies is about 1%. The one-year mortality is almost 5% in a meta-analysis, and the four-year mortality from the large sweetheart registry was 13%. Another meta-analysis found a 2.2% annual mortality after Minoka, but as you can see, that's higher than in the general population. So it's not a good thing to have. Another set of common questions, are the outcomes worse than in people with no prior cardiovascular disease? This is really worse than not having an event at all. And are normal and non-obstructive coronaries the same in terms of prognosis? This study answers both, actually. So our y-axis here is all-cause mortality or non-fatal MI. And you can see that the Minoka patients have a lower event rate than those who presented with obstructive coronary disease at the time of their MI, but it's worse than people who are hospitalized with no cardiovascular disease. And the patients with normal coronaries on their angiogram or with mild coronary disease here have a very similar prognosis. And many studies show that's true either before adjustment or after adjustment for other risk factors. Major adverse cardiovascular events definitely accrue in long-term follow-up. The Sweetheart Registry had over 9,000 patients with Minoka and documented not only that 13% four-year death rate, but a four-year recurrent MI rate of 7%, heart failure 6%, 4% of stroke, and that adds up to a 24% four-year MACE rate. And that's substantial. In CAS PCI, this now links to the American Medicare database, so the patients are older, and therefore we see even higher event rates in an even larger sample. 
So 12% one-year death rate, a 1% recurrent MI rate in one year, 6% heart failure hospitalization, and 18% one-year MACE rate. Across several studies, the predictors of adverse outcomes are ST elevation at the time of the presentation, lower EF, and older age. The reinfarction events in my mind are very interesting, and I think they can tell us a little something about pathogenesis of the initial event. So in Sweetheart, there were 570 patients with Minoka who had a recurrent MI. And the first interesting finding is that only 340 of them had another angiogram. So the people treating them thought they knew what this was, and they thought it was Minoka again. But it wasn't always. So of those who had an angiogram, about half had progressed to obstructive atherosclerosis on their subsequent angiogram. And on the right here, you can see that no matter what the interval between the two MI events when the first one was Minoka, you were about equally likely to have another Minoka with your second MI or obstructive coronary disease. So this talks to me a little bit about the unpredictable nature of progression of atherosclerosis and makes me think that atherosclerosis was likely a part of many of the initial events as well. Once there was a second event, the mortality afterward is higher, but it's not higher if that second event was Minoka or MI with obstructive coronary disease. I hope I've convinced you that this is not a great thing for our patients to have, and so we'd like to know how to treat it. But the best treatment is unknown because there has been no treatment trials dedicated to this population. What are we doing now? Again, from the Action Get With The Guidelines registry, we can see that the Minoka patients in light blue are getting less of all of the secondary prevention medications than the MI with obstructive coronary disease patients in darker blue. And that's true whether we're looking at the atherothrombotic prevention or the what I would call sort of the consequences of MI uh, prevention, especially with beta blockers preventing adverse remodeling, and ASARB doing a little bit of both, preventing some atherosclerotic events, but also uh, preventing adverse myocardial remodeling. And if we drill down on the ACE-ARB and beta blocker question, we see here at sites that we're seeing at least 20 Minoka patients in the study period and looking only at patients who did not have an ironclad indication for one of these drugs. They had a preserved EF, preserved GFR, did not have diabetes. You can see that across centers here, there's a wide range of likelihood of prescribing these drugs to their patients. And to me, especially when I look at beta blockers, this tells me that people differ in whether they really believe this is MI or not. The optimal treatment, though, is probably different based on the underlying mechanism. And I think it's in incomplete understanding of these mechanisms for a long time that has led to variable use of secondary prevention medications by clinicians. If there is uncertainty about which of these post-MI treatment guideline recommendations should apply to Minoka patients. Here's everything that causes Minoka. So it could be plaque rupture or plaque erosion. Some patients have coronary artery spasms. Others have dissection that was not recognized on an angiogram, and some have thrombosis or thromboembolism. And then we have the overlap syndrome. Some patients truly have Takotsubo syndrome, the transient reversible left ventricular dysfunction syndrome that's often precipitated by emotional or physical stress. And right now, that is not considered MI in our universal definition of MI, so I call it an overlap syndrome. And we have myocarditis. So not the myocarditis that you came in knowing was myocarditis, we sometimes call this surprise myocarditis because you thought it was MI, but by the time you do extra imaging of cardiac MR, you may find that you were wrong and it was really myocarditis. But I'll remind you, there's always a differential diagnosis for all of our patients. So if somebody presents with an elevated troponin, that may be a stable elevation, and then we call it chronic myocardial injury because of, let's say, structural heart disease or chronic kidney disease. And even if there's a rise and fall, there may not be acute ischemia. We call that acute myocardial injury and it happens in heart failure or myocarditis, for example. But if there is acute ischemia, okay, we're calling it acute myocardial infarction. Most of those patients will have atherothrombosis, but some have a supply-demand imbalance. So they may have increased demand because of severe hypertension or a tachyarrhythmia, or they may have an abrupt decrease in supply from vasospasm or an embolism. But there's always a differential diagnosis. And when I think of this differential diagnosis sort of pictorially, I think most patients are going to have type 1 atherosclerotic MI. But some patients are going to have spasm or dissection or supply-demand mismatch. Some of our patients present a sudden death. Some will have stent thrombosis or periprocedural MI. And some are not MI at all. And I want to get back to those. And another principle that we're very familiar with in pathogenesis of MI is that there's often overlap between these syndromes. So we know that spasm, for example, happens in areas that happen, uh, have some atherosclerosis. That's typical. 
we think that people with supply demand mismatch, you know, if you have atrial fibrillation and a rapid ventricular response, you're more likely to have that troponin elevation and to have a small MI or a large MI for that matter if you already have obstructive atherosclerosis and you have a supply problem. So we know there's overlap and we know that there's a variety of mechanisms. We also know that coronary angiography, while clearly the most important diagnostic test in a patient who's determined to have MI, is uh, limited in its ability to see the wall. So we have here a uh, classic example of an angiogram that looks very smooth and even. And at this spot, we see intravascular ultrasound, and we see a very thin wall and a normal size lumen. But at this spot, which looks, if anything, even a little better on the angiogram, we have the same size lumen. We see that on the angiogram, and yet we have this crescentic plaque. This can also happen in the context of a plaque rupture. Not all plaque rupture is angiographically evident. So in this schematic of a cross-section of a plaque, we've got a patient with a necrotic core, inflammatory cells, smooth muscle cells. And if this plaque breaks, at, at the shoulder is shown here, and we get a thrombus that's this size, we see an obstructive appearance on an angiogram. But if instead the thrombus looks like this, we might not see this thing at all, and yet this thrombus can embolize and cause infarction. How common is this? Well, multiple single center studies using intravascular ultrasound or coronary optical coherence tomography have demonstrated plaque rupture or erosion in 29 to 38% of patients with Minoka. You can compare that to about 75% rupture or erosion in STEMI, 4% in stable patients with coronary disease, and none in stable patients with non-obstructive disease in multiple studies. A two-center Minoka study using CMR first to rule out myocarditis before OCT found that there was plaque rupture or erosion in 80% of the patients. When it's present, that active plaque is often not located in the lesion that looks the worst on the angiogram. Let's talk again about plaque erosion. This has a different underlying plaque morphology with more smooth muscle and proteoglycans, no necrotic core. And in this case, it's believed to be denuded endothelium that leads to thrombosis. This is not seen on intravascular ultrasound, but it is a common cause of acute coronary syndrome based on coronary optical coherence tomography studies. And it's more common among younger women in autopsy studies of sudden death victims which is why it's been an area of interest for us in terms of Minoka, because that also has preference for young women. I am often asked if the thrombus is not occlusive, what's causing myonecrosis if you have a plaque rupture or erosion? And I think there are two different mechanisms for this. So we've seen in our multimodality imaging studies, we've seen two patterns of myocardial injury. And on the top, we have a cardiac MRI that shows myocardial edema. These are T2-weighted images, and we see this bright area in the anterior wall, anterior septum, and apex. It's a large territory, and this is a patient with a proximal LAD plaque rupture. So I imagine that that proximal LAD was transiently severely narrowed or completely closed, and I think that would have happened either because there was spasm that was relieved by the time of the angiogram, or maybe there was transient thrombosis that spontaneously lysed. We also saw some cases that looked like embolization of atherothrombotic debris, very clearly demarcated but small areas of subendocardial to transmural late enhancement. And I imagine that this is from that small thrombus in the schematic I showed you that embolizes to a branch. Let's switch gears and talk about coronary artery spasm. This is a really important diagnosis to make because the treatment is different. It's calcium channel blockers and nitrates, but it may be difficult to prove. If there is spasm spontaneously on an angiogram, that's helpful, but you don't know that sometimes happens on its own anyway. Provocative testing has not routinely been done at the time of the acute angiogram because of concerns of precipitating another infarct. But there have been four recent studies with brave souls who are using provocative testing either acutely or relatively acutely, and somewhere between a quarter and two thirds have inducible spasm, which is quite high. When there's spasm, about half of it is epicardial, 75 to 90% narrowing, and the other half is microvascular, where you don't see that degree of narrowing. Maybe the arteries look exactly the same, but you recapitulate the patient's symptoms and maybe EKG changes. Most of the patients with spasm will also have some non-obstructive coronary disease. It would be really nice if we could predict which patients have spasm. This is from the largest of those studies, CAMIAR, and you can see that there are some factors associated with spasm, but the differences between these groups are not as overwhelming as I would like for a predictive role. So the patients with spasm are a little younger, they're more likely to be male, more typical chest pain, more prior angina, little more ST elevation, and the EFs are higher. But again, none of these differences are all that profound, 
and none of the traditional coronary artery disease risk factors predicted spasm or the absence of spasm, nor did peak troponin or lipid. I wonder then if Minoka can be multifactorial. So I started to talk to you about this idea of the overlap between spasm and atherosclerosis. And I've been um, trying to sort these patients into buckets for a long time, but I have a feeling there's more to the story and there may be some overlap. So this is from a very interesting study that used coronary optical coherence tomography to interrogate sites that had provoked spasm when they were testing for um, spasm provocation. And I'm showing you proportions from the subset of patients who either had MI or out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. And we can see that one in eight of these spasm sites had a rupture. So just for orientation, because I'm going to show a lot of OCT images, this is the OCT catheter. This is the guide wire, and there's a cone-shaped shadow behind it because OCT is radial imaging. And then this, we see the lumen here and this luminal interface. And over here, I think you can see that there's a discontinuity. This is not a very large plaque. It might not even be a lipidic plaque. There is clearly a discontinuity in the cap there. And at 25% of spasm sites, they saw plaque erosion. So here, this dark band is the media, and we can see there's thickening of this yellower part that is the intima. And on top of the intima, even though this is not a lipid-rich plaque, we see this little thing that looks like a frog jumping out, and that's a thrombus. It's shadowing behind because light doesn't see well through thrombus. Very common finding at spasm sites. So spasm and erosion may go together. About half of the spasm sites had luminal irregularity, and this is something where I imagine it like the old uh, fabric-covered hair ties that they used to call scrunchies in New York. Um, so the elastic band is holding the fabric in, and it has this scalloped appearance, and I think that's what's happening to the intima here. And it was a rare number of uh, spasm sites. Only 6% of spasm sites had none of these findings. Thrombosis is likely to be a factor in Minoka, whether it's in situ thrombosis, thromboembolism, or perhaps an underlying thrombophilia. Factor V, Leiden, is present in more young Minoka patients than age and sex matched patients with MI and obstructive coronary disease. And this is provocative because we think of factor V, Leiden as only predisposing to venous thromboembolism, but that may not be the whole story. Up to 24% of Minoka patients may have an inherited thrombophilia, including factor V Leiden, protein C or S deficiency, or antiphospholipid antibodies. That's similar to cryptogenic stroke. And when thinking about antiphospholipid antibodies, when they're present in an MI patient, about one in five will have Minoka. Compare that to 6% overall. You might also consider testing for factor 12 deficiency, factor 8 uh, excess, or antithrombin deficiency. Exogenous hormone use may play a role. We've seen several cases where patients were taking higher doses of hormones for various reasons and had thrombosis. And platelets may also be part of pathogenesis, including via interaction with other cell types. That's under investigation at NYU by my colleague, Jeffrey Berger. Turning to coronary dissection, which I know is an area of interest there, it's a cause of some cases of Minoka, but of course, most dissection is diagnosed on an angiogram. It's not Minoka because it narrows the artery more than 50%. So for example, in this angiogram, we see a very abrupt change in caliber of this vessel that persists throughout the rest of that vessel's course. We recognize this as dissection. We would not call it Minoka. But here we have a different angiogram that just has a little bit of narrowing, and we might not know what that is from. It's a little bumpy. Could it be atherosclerosis? So it's only with intracoronary imaging that we see here this intramural hematoma, and we can say that's dissection. We estimate that about 1% to 5% of Minoka cases, based on our and other studies, will be an unrecognized dissection. But most dissection is going to be angiographically diagnosed. And I think these two things get conflated largely because they both disproportionately affect young women. Myocarditis is an alternate diagnosis, and the diagnosis is made on cardiac MRI. The clinical presentation often mimics MI, but we, instead you will see a non-ischemic pattern of late enhancement outside one coronary territory involving the epicardium, the midmyocardium, the right side. Um, this CMR pattern is present in about a third of cases that are clinically diagnosed as Minoka, so it's fairly common. It's more common among those who have angiographically normal coronaries among men and at younger ages. This is a really important diagnosis to make because the treatment is supportive. None of the usual secondary prevention medications after MI are needed, especially once LV function recovers if it was depressed. Getting back to Takasubo syndrome, you know, I say right now it's not part of the universal definition of MI, but that could change as we continue to understand pathogenesis. We might suspect this diagnosis based on a typical wall motion pattern and triggering by stress, 
But I just like to say that a cath is still needed because acute MI can cause a similar wall motion pattern. Cardiac MRI may be useful in differentiating Takotsubo syndrome from infarct. Sometimes it's instead an apical infarct. But the finding of cardiomyopathy, which was mostly Takotsubo in this study, confers a much higher risk of death even than the finding of an infarct on your MRI. And that's very interesting to me. There's a differential diagnosis of Takotsubo syndrome, like there's a differential diagnosis to everything. Sometimes it's due to coronary spasm. Sometimes it's due to dissection that wasn't recognized initially. You can sometimes find a plaque rupture with intracoronary imaging in the left main or the LAD. And sometimes it's due to hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, especially if there's not that much septal thickening, but there's a lot of uh, outflow tract obstruction that's provocable. Sometimes that will cause apical ballooning. If at some point people think that microvascular or multivessel spasm is part of the pathogenesis, I think this is going to get put back under the header of MI, but that's for a different talk. With all these causes, we wanted to know how many patients have each underlying cause. And that answer is important. It's important for clinical trials because if we're testing an agent, we want to make sure that agent is rational for whatever it is that is causing this event. It's important for interim treatment. We'd like to tailor therapy even if we don't have all the imaging available. And it's important for patient counseling. I know that the patients who come see me would like to know, do I really need all these medications? And I'd like to have the answer. If we treat it based on the underlying cause, it might look like this. The patients with plaque rupture or erosion get antiplatelets and statins. The patients with spasm get calcium blockers and nitrates. The patients with dissection maybe get beta blockade, probably no antiplatelet, probably no statin. Those with thromboembolism, we treat the source. And then if they have Takotsubo syndrome, observational studies suggest that ACE inhibitors may be helpful. And if they have myocarditis, they don't need any of these things. So how then can we make the etiologic diagnosis? What we have as part of the AHA scientific statement, this traffic light diagram, this is our affectionate name for this thing because it's a bit Byzantine. And the idea is that you just sort of walk through and consider different levels of diagnostic testing as you get there. So we start with somebody who meets the universal definition of MI, rise and fall of troponin, signs or symptoms, non-obstructive disease. And then we reconsider the clinical context. Was this really pulmonary embolism? There's a series of 100 patients, consecutive patients with Minoka, who all underwent CT for PE. None of them had PE, but still sometimes were fooled. Uh, could it be a cardiac contusion? Is it something else entirely? And then once you've excluded those things, we say that you have a working diagnosis of Minoka. And the first thing to do is to go back to the angiogram and make sure that something hasn't been missed in the heat of the moment of the case. So looking back, sometimes we see, oh, yes, there really was a dissection there or there was a branch vessel occlusion, or the very distal uh, part of the coronary is cut off. And then we think that we know what might have happened there. We do an LV functional assessment to see if it might be Takasubo syndrome or another cardiomyopathy. And then we have this bridging this in the next section because not everybody will have access to cardiac MRI, but it's a good idea to try and rule out myocarditis using a cardiac MRI. And then once you've done these things, we say, yes, you have a diagnosis in this patient of Minoka you might consider doing further diagnostic testing, like intracoronary imaging or a coronary functional assessment looking for spasm. The ESC recently put out ACS guidelines, and they uh, show the traffic light diagram in a slightly different way. So they've, the, it's a lot of crossing arrows, but I think the most important feature here is that MRI for the ESC is solidly in the yellow. They feel that if you could possibly get a cardiac MRI, you need it to rule out myocarditis before you formally give the patient the diagnosis of Minoka. We wanted to know how often patients have each of these uh, underlying causes, and so we embarked on this American Heart Association-funded study that was multicenter and called the Women's Heart Attack Research Program. We wanted to know how often there were vascular causes of Minoka on coronary optical coherence tomography, how often there were ischemic or non-ischemic myocardial abnormalities on cardiac MRI, and how often we could identify each of the underlying causes using both of these techniques. We started with women who were referred for cardiac cath with the intent to perform PCI for MI. We did not enroll patients who had an alternate explanation of troponin elevation. They had their cath, and if they had either angiographic evidence of dissection or of obstructive coronary disease, they had no research imaging. But if they had Minoka, they were to have three-vessel OCT and then a cardiac MRI within a week. The images were read at independent core laboratories that did not know what the other studies had shown. Here are our study sites. We were very grateful for their participation. Here are our women. We had 301 women with a clinical diagnosis of MI enrolled at 16 sites. 170 of them proved to have Minoka, 
23 of them didn't undergo OCT, usually because of a contrast allergy or particularly tortuous vessels, and two of the OCTs were not interpretable. That left us with 145 OCT, and 116 of those women came back for their cardiac MRI. The median age of our women was 60, 50% 50 were white non-Hispanic, about half had hypertension, and 16% had diabetes. The median peak troponin was just under one. This was a median of 17 times the upper limit of normal, so not a tiny troponin elevation. Very few of our patients had STEMI because most of our sites got consent for OCT before CAS because it was not their usual clinical practice. About half had a segmental wall motion abnormality on an echocardiogram, and about half the, the site felt that the coronary angiogram was normal. But the core lab didn't think these angiograms were normal. They said the median maximal stenosis was 30%. Here are our OCT findings. 46% of the women had a culprit lesion, and the large majority of those were atherothrombotic in origin, just one dissection and a few that had that intimal bumping that looked like spasm. I'm going to show a set of OCT images, so let me just give you a normal as a reference point. So here again is the OCT catheter, the guide wire, and the shadow. The lumen has been cleared by contrast so that we can see through it because OCT uses light to make images. And we have the intima here. The darker band exterior to the intima is the arterial media. And then exterior to that, we have the adventitia and then perivascular tissue. So this idea where you can see three layers, that's a normal appearance. Here is a plaque rupture in a patient with minoca. And all of these are going to be arranged from distal to proximal because OCT is a pullback. So here we have catheter, guide wire, shadow. And we can see that in this area, we have a normal trilayer appearance. But over here, we have some plaque. We have a smudgy appearance. The light doesn't penetrate through plaque well. We say it's attenuated. This, again, guide wire and shadow. And there are these little lakes of contrast that have migrated into the wall because there's a rupture. In this middle frame, we see that this plaque now meets criteria for being lipidic because we just can't see through it at all because there's so much uh, lipid in there, and that the fibrous cap is fairly thin. This is a protruding thrombus, and we don't see behind it because light doesn't penetrate through thrombus. And in this most proximal frame, we see a discontinuity in the fibrous cap leading into this lipidic plaque. So the earliest consequence of a plaque rupture on pathology and on OCT is an intraplaque cavity. And this is an example. We see that there is some attenuation in the wall, but it's not as striking as the lipidic plaque. This crescent is organized thrombus. And there are areas that look like there might be contrast in the wall here as well. Here we see in the proximal slice that the fibrous cap is very thin. That's probably a recent rupture site. Now in the hours to days after a rupture, we start to see healing. And this can happen very early on pathologic studies and on OCT. And it gives this appearance that's called layered plaque. Again, here we see strong attenuation. There's a lipidic plaque in this patient. But interior to that, we see that the intima is very thickened and uniform looking. And this is early healing. In this spot, we see an area that's a little dark track through that area of healing, and we think this was a recent rupture site. Now, these are two different patients, but putting them together, I think you can see how a rupture might begin to heal early after an MI. Uh, we had no complications of OCT in these patients, but transient spasm was quite common. Here we compare culprit lesions in our Minoka patients to a concurrently enrolled Japanese cohort having OCT with MI and obstructive coronary disease. And in short, I think the most instructive thing here is that there are a lot of similarities between these two sides. The biggest difference is that in the MICAD cohort, the lumen is smaller and the plaques are bigger, but we knew that they have more atherosclerosis. So here's that example of plaque rupture I just showed you, and here's an example of plaque rupture in this MICAD cohort. We can see there's a lot more plaque. It goes all the way around the vessel here. We still see a discontinuity in a thin fibrous cap. The cavity was bigger here, and it's been evacuated, which may be interesting in terms of prothrombotic uh, content. Here's an intraplaque cavity. And looking at this most proximal slice in the MICAD, I think you can see this looks an awful lot like the intraplaque cavity in the Minoka patient. But here, in fact, the fibrous cap is a little thicker, and there's certainly much more plaque in the obstructive coronary disease example. Looking at layered plaque, again, we do see layered plaque acutely in these patients. And in the MICAD version, this is circumferential plaque with a smaller lumen, but otherwise it looks very similar. The clinical correlates of having an OCT culprit lesion in our Minoka cohort were diabetes, the site designation that the angiogram was abnormal, and older age. But not peak troponin, 
and not the vessel level angiographic stenosis severity in the opinion of the core laboratory. In fact, the angiogram was rated as normal by sites in 34% with an OCT culprit lesion. Now that was less than in patients without an OCT culprit lesion, but it was still awfully common. And we found that the more vessels that were imaged, the more likely we were to find an OCT culprit in the core lab review. Here are our MRI findings. 33% of our women had evidence of infarction based on late gadolinium enhancement. So here's an example with late gadolinium enhanced imaging on the left and T2 weighted imaging for edema on the right. In both, the white is abnormal. And we see here a subendocardial to transmural large infarction. And the T2 hyperintensity tells us that this was acute. And as was typical here, the T2 goes beyond the area of late enhancement. There's a larger area of injury or area at risk. 95% of our infarctions had edema, indicating that these are in fact acute MI. 21% of our patients had a regional injury pattern, and this was present when there was edema within a coronary territory in the absence of late enhancement. And often, as in this example, there was also a wall motion abnormality. This case has spinning over here in the systolic frame showing us that there's anteroceptal hypokinesis. Histologic studies show that this is a consequence of ischemia and reperfusion. 21% of our patients had a non-ischemic finding on their cardiac MRI, like this example of myocarditis. And 26% of them were normal. Correlates of an MRI abnormality were higher peak troponin, lower creatinine, and for reasons that I really don't understand, higher diastolic blood pressure. But not the presence of an OCT culprit lesion and not angiographic stenosis severity. The quicker the MRI was done, the more likely it was to be abnormal. Multiple studies have shown that. Our median infarct size was just under four grams, which is small, but I showed you that there are large examples as well. We thought that we might be able to find a troponin threshold below which it doesn't make sense to do a cardiac MR because it's so likely to be normal, and we couldn't. So no matter how low the troponin, there was still more than a 15% chance that the CMR would be abnormal, suggesting that everybody probably needs one. So now if the Minoka is really an MI, why is there no late enhancement in some of the cases? And I think this is the reason. Even though MRI has the potential to identify very small amounts of myocardial necrosis, there are studies, including studies with coronary disease, showing that not everybody with an MI will have late enhancement. And I think this might relate to the spatial distribution of myocytes that are infarcted and the duration of occlusion. So in this example I showed you before with a large territory of regional edema, I can imagine that if a myocyte dies over here and another one dies over there and another guy dies over there, because they're not neighbors, we're not seeing a coalescing area of late enhancement. And yet, there's a large area at risk, and that troponin is truly from an ischemic injury. This kind of regional edema is thought to be an earlier sign of injury, and maybe if that collusion had gone on longer, we would see late enhancement, but then we also would have seen an obstructed area on an angiogram. I think that this is a very instructive study looking at MI with coronary disease and what cardiac MRI can add. In fact, an alternate diagnosis was reached in the sequential study in one in eight patients on a cardiac MR. So they started with 114 consecutive patients with non-STEMI, and they decided on an infarct artery in 72 of them. Some of the patients on their cardiac MRI had no late enhancement. That happens in Minoka. 12.5% of that group had something else entirely. They had myocarditis or Takotsubo or amyloid. Some of them had the wrong infarct artery designated, and in some of these, there was single vessel coronary disease, so obviously you're going to call that one the culprit, but when they looked at the MRI, the infarct territory was not related to that culprit. So in fact, in a way of thinking, it was actually a Minoka. When we put our OCT and cardiac MRI findings together, there were some instructive um, conclusions that we could reach. So looking at these patients with an OCT culprit who had an MRI, 69% of them had either an infarct on late enhancement or this regional injury pattern of ischemia. So most of them, we can see that the plaque is causing myocardial injury. And looking at those across with MI or regional injury, the ischemic CMR findings, 44% of those had no OCT culprit. And we think that the reason for these was either spasm or thromboembolism. Or maybe we missed it because not everybody had three-vessel OCT, and OCT is not perfect. Another instructive finding from this is that the arteries that appeared to the sites to be normal were not always normal. Even if there was angiographically normal appearance to the angiogram, some had intraplaque cavity or layered plaque or thrombus without rupture, 
there were a set of findings there, even when you thought the angiogram was normal as an enrolling site. But there was not a difference between CMR findings uh, in those who had non-obstructive disease and normal appearing arteries. Putting everything together, we were able to find a cause of the Minoka presentation in 85% of the women, and that was better than OCT alone or MRI alone. There's a case from this study that I think is particularly instructive, and I always think it's fun to go through a case, so let me show you this one. She's a 44-year-old woman with anemia and heavy menstrual bleeding. She had a hemoglobin of seven two weeks prior to the presentation. She had chest pain for two hours, but she looks well. She's young. And she had very subtle inferior ST elevation with a mildly elevated troponin. But the next troponin was more substantially elevated, and there was recurrent chest pain even after a transfusion. So she undergoes a cardiac cath. And here's her right coronary artery. She has no coronary disease risk factors, but she does have some flat that we can appreciate. And here's her left. There's some ectasia here. We see something in the proximal LAD. This LAD wraps around. And here's her OCT. So I'll just pause it for a second. Catheter, guide wire, and shadow. Here's the intima. This part looks normal. It has intima media adventitia, but most of the arc of this vessel has plaque in it. And as we keep going, we're going to see some branches coming in. There's one. There's going to be another one, I think. And then if you focus here, there's going to be a, a tract into the plaque, and here's a big thrombus. I think the freeze frames make it a little clearer. So here's an intimal disruption into a plaque. This is a lipid-rich plaque. We don't see through it well. And then as we pull back, this cap is thin, and there's a big thrombus here. So we were not expecting a thin cap fibroatheroma in this 44-year-old woman with no risk factors. Her cardiac MRI shows an infarct in the distal LAD territory. That was a wraparound LAD, and it ends right here, where we see what basically looks like an embolic inferior infarct. So this was really instructive because, first of all, it was an inferior infarct. There was ST elevation, very minor, in the inferior leads. And so if we were imaging just two vessels or one, I think the LAD probably would have been last on the list, and yet that's where the finding is. Nobody was expecting this, and she had heavy menstrual bleeding. This woman would not have been getting antiplatelet therapy or statin without this imaging. So I think in this case, it really shows you what intracoronary imaging and MRI have to add. And some people had said, this is a supply-demand mismatch MI. But, you know, she's 44, and her hemoglobin is low, but it's not three. So we felt that it was not likely to be supply-demand mismatch, and it wasn't. Just so you think that they're not all like this, so here's that case. And now here are two cases that are fairly similar but have a different outcome. Here's a 50-year-old woman, also chest pain, also anemia, also minor ST elevation, very similarly elevated troponin, and she has a mild LAD stenosis, too. But this one had coronary dissection that goes along with an anteroceptal and apical infarct. And here's a different patient, a little older, more ST elevation and a higher troponin, also mild LAD stenosis after her intracoronary nitro. But she's got a layered plaque. And lest you think that layered plaque must be old, here's her cardiac MRI showing that she has a large MI and the T2-weighted imaging is super bright. This is definitely acute. So different cases, different findings. Um, key findings from HARP then, multimodality imaging in women with Minoka, 64% of the women had imaging evidence of MI, 21% had a non-ischemic alternate diagnosis. The two imaging studies provided useful diagnostic information independently and in combination, but they correlated well when there were OCT culprit lesions, and that shows us that the non-obstructive culprits frequently do cause Minoka. Spasm or thromboembolism was probably the cause of the MI or regional ischemic injury in cases without a culprit lesion. So the mechanisms of Minoka in our women were similar to mechanisms of MI with obstructive coronary disease, atherothrombosis, with a possible contribution of coronary spasm. So when I get back to this differential diagnosis, looking again, I would say that if I compare Minoka to MI with coronary disease, okay, there's probably, there's a lot of type 1 MI. It's less. There's probably more type 2 MI. We still see MI causing uh, sudden cardiac death. Some of it is not MI, probably more than in patients with MI and obstructive coronary disease, but some of those MIs with CAD were really myocarditis too. And in Minoka, we have a lot with an unknown mechanism, about 
So when I look at this together, I think, you know, there may no longer be a need for the term Minoka after a while, after we all get accustomed to treating this. It's just that there's a differential diagnosis anytime with an MI presentation. How should we manage this problem? The ESC guidelines include recommendations on how to treat Minoka, and this is for the first time in one of these documents, so I get really excited about it. And they suggest that in patients with an initial working diagnosis of Minoka, you should follow a diagnostic algorithm to differentiate true MI from alternative diagnoses, and that's that traffic light diagram. It's recommended to perform CMR in all Minoka patients without an obvious underlying cause, and then manage according to what you find. And what about those patients where we don't know? We either don't have the imaging or the imaging is not showing us the answer. Well, then they recommend that you treat according to usual secondary prevention guidelines for atherosclerotic disease. Here's an observational study of secondary prevention after Minoka. This is from the Sweetheart Registry. It was propensity matching uh, of cohorts by medical treatment with four-year follow-up. In all of these graphs, red is treated with the medication group and blue is untreated. And you can see that selection for treatment with statins is associated with a better prognosis, and also true for ACE inhibitors and ARBs. For beta blockers, there was a trend toward lower risk among those selected for treatment, but there was no signal with dual antiplatelet therapy, which is interesting to me because we've just shown you that there's a lot of plaque rupture and layering of plaque here. There's a Minocobat trial that's ongoing in Sweden and Australia to test beta blockers and ACE inhibitors in an all-comers Minoka group. And this is the first one I'm aware of. This is a randomized trial with subset data in Minoka. So I think that's a herald of things to come. And this is from current OASIS 7. They had Minoka in 6.7% of their enrolled patients, so that's quite typical. And the post hoc analysis they did is of high versus low dose clopidogrel in combination with aspirin. Higher dose clopidogrel was associated with poorer outcomes than standard dose among Minoka patients, but not MI with CAD. Now, I don't think anybody's using double dose clopidogrel in these patients, but it's just interesting to me that more antiplatelet therapy is clearly not better, and also that we can do this kind of a subset analysis. There's a lot more to come. The funding uh, for this study also included funding for a basic science study and a population study, and I'll just give you a little preview of those. The basic science study is figuring out whether platelet activity will be different in women with Minoka versus MI with obstructive coronary disease and even control women without MI. And our stress management study will report soon, but for now we wanted to know if women with Minoka had different stress levels than women with MI and CAD, and in fact, they have lower stress than women with MI and obstructive coronary disease. Why do female patients have Minoka more often than men? Are the mechanisms different? Is stress more important? These are all questions that we're looking to answer with the next phase of our studies. So a few take-home points, Minoka, is it MI? Yes, about two-thirds of the time. And you might say to your patient, you had heart attack with open arteries or Minoka. More testing may help us figure out why this happened to you and might help me understand which medicines you need. I think of these patients a lot like a box of chocolates. They might look the same on the outside, but on the inside with imaging, they may be very different. When do we apply this testing as it stands today? MRI for everybody and OCT when it will change your decision making about antiplatelet therapy like in that patient with bleeding. When you think there might be dissection but you can't confirm it or just when you want to know the diagnosis with more certainty but you must recognize that you may not be right about the culprit vessel, especially if you didn't do cardiac MRI. We generally reserve spasm testing in follow-up for persistent chest pain. How do we treat when the underlying diagnosis is uncertain as it stands today? I generally use antiplatelet therapy and statins unless I'm completely sure there's no athero. Calcium blockade in case there was spasm. ACE are based on sweetheart, and I generally reserve beta blockade for patients with an infarct on an MRI or low EF, or if I think there was dissection. I'd like to thank the HARP team, the many investigators, including the core lab directors, the AHA for funding, my longtime mentor, Judy Hockman, and I thank you very much for inviting me and for your attention. And I hope we'll have some time for questions. Thanks. Thank you very much, Dr. Reynolds. That was an amazing overview. I learned a lot. I wrote one million things here uh, in terms of questions. Uh, I, I'm not going to, however, you know, uh, hijack the, the question and answer period. Um, we already have a question from the audience here, and I was going to combine this with a question of my own, which I think you touched upon at the very end of your presentation. So I'm trying to adapt uh, what I'm learning from you today to our capabilities at the, here at the Heart Institute and in Ontario, where we actually have an MRI in the building and we have OCT too, although my understanding and my interventional colleagues in the audience, please correct me if I'm wrong about this, but my understanding is that OCT is not reimbursed, therefore it's not used as widely as it perhaps could have been. 
if if there was a, a reimbursement to it, I, I I can stand corrected. So please correct me if I'm wrong. So as I'm thinking about this, um, my question to you, based on your experience, both clinical and academic, do you feel like the OCT is a sine qua non diagnostic step uh, to be able to get your diagnosis? Or if you have a solid MRI program, does that suffice uh, in the workup of the of the uh, Minoka patient? And I'll combine this question with a question here from my colleague, Dr. Andrew Crean, who is saying, if the initial angiogram appears normal, but the MRI shows focal myocardial injury, should the patient return to the cath lab for OCT? No, both very interesting questions. Thank you. So um, let me address your colleague's question first. The French study did it that way. They did MRI and they would bring the patient back for OCT. We have not wanted to do it that way. It's difficult for me to convince my angiographers that we should undertake an entirely additional cardiac catheterization for OCT because they feel like they've drunk the Kool-Aid and, and they understand that this is an atherothrombotic problem and they would be happy for us to just treat it. But you, there's nothing else that is going, besides intracoronary imaging, that will tell us for sure if this is active plaque or not. As we all know, you can have plaque and that doesn't mean it's causing MI. It may just be lurking there and, and silent. So if we really want to know if plaque is causative, then we're going to need intracoronary imaging. But if we feel confident treating with antiplatelet therapy and statins, then I am not sure for the individual patient how much it will add. Um, but, you know, things are changing. So as these studies are coming out and more and more studies are supporting intracoronary imaging, we may be doing more of it, and it may wind up impacting therapy. But that's the test I usually put on any test, right, is, is it going to change my management? And it really depends what your general management of Minoka is. Mm -hmm. That's, that's a great answer. Thank you very much. And let me actually go on to speak, since we're talking about plaques and OCTs, another question from the audience from my colleague, Dr. Derek So, who's one of our interventional cardiologists. He's asking, is Minoka, in Minoka patients where OCT identifies a specific lesion, for example, a thrombus or an erosion, do you think there should be thoughts to prophylactic stenting if the underlying plaque is even less than 50%? Any evidence that future events are in the same territory, for example? I would love to know that. Um, it's difficult to be sure because in order to answer your question truly, we would either need a randomized trial, which is going to be very challenging to do. You know, the Minoka bat thing is, is like 5,000 patients. Um, and I don't know if we're going to do a stenting trial like that. Or we would need the kind of natural history study, including intracoronary imaging, sort of like a prospect version of this. So as we follow our small number of Minoka patients who've had comprehensive imaging and they have subsequent events, will be, begin to get a handle on that question. But I've talked to certain CT investigators about referencing our studies back to old CTs, and they'll say, you know, mostly people have more than one plaque, and you don't know which one was the initial culprit anyway, so how are you going to tell if it's the same uh, vessel? So it's a really interesting idea, and maybe we need a mechanical fix to these ruptured plaques, and I don't know how we're going to get the answer. So much to learn. I think that's what we learned when we, when we work with Women's Heart Health, is there's just so much to learn uh, ahead of us. Thanks for that. Uh, I'll ask one question, changing topics a little bit towards microvascular disease and, and vasospasm. Dr. Quan Chen, uh, who's uh, one of our uh, cardiologists as well and imager, uh, he's asking, what is your protocol for spasm and how often is it done in these conditions? Our protocol for spasm, we're a little bit conservative on this, I think. And I have one angiographer who's interested in doing provocative testing, but he doesn't like to do provocative testing very soon after MI. We mostly will bring patients back if they're having persistent chest pain afterward, and we just don't know what that chest pain is from, mm -hmm. or in people where they're not sure that they want to take a calcium blocker, for example, if it's really, again, if it's really going to change the management. But we did have a recent case of a nurse here. And, um, you know, even I started to feel like, is this troponin really real? I'm not sure. Because she kept having these little bouts of chest pain with her menstrual period. So that's a thing, catamenial chest pain, and it's thought to be due to spasm. Mm -hmm. But every time she would have chest pain, her troponin would bump a little bit. And the trick was that it wasn't really going down to normal. And that's where I started to get confused. But it was rising and falling every time she had chest pain, and we kept admitting her. And then finally, we said, you know, we've got to do provocative testing in this woman and see if this is something or nothing. And she had profound LED coronary spasm. Mm -hmm. So um, that's another phenotype is this recurrent uh, menstrual cycle chest pain that's causing even very low levels of troponin. And it had this disconnect that, you know, usually you dis if she has chest pain for 12 hours and has a troponin of, you know, 0.08, you'd usually say, mm, I'm not so sure about that. 
but it was clearly the case in her. So as you said, you know, we're constantly learning the more that we do this testing, and maybe we should be doing provocative testing more. Interesting that you mentioned the cannabinoid chest pain because we see that quite often in our SCAD patients. But now that I know about it from SCAD, I'm actually paying attention and asking. I'm finding them in the minocas and the nocas too. Or sometimes I have also noticed anecdotally women that seem to be in their menopausal transition, uh, you know, and then all of a sudden they have out of control chest pain. So I think a lot to learn there. Um, Dr. Yeah. Liu has had his hand up for a while. So let me pass it on to him so he can ask you his question too. Yeah, so this is fantastic talk and really actually underscores the importance of uh, precision medicine, right? You know, you really need to actually understand exactly what's happening to your patient. And uh, uh, a couple, uh, one thought and one question. And I wondered, uh, you know, because actually, uh, rather than having a large plaque that ruptured, you know, occluded the vessel causing a very, very large infarct, that I wonder many of these conditions, in fact, have that cyclic nature to it, you know, whether there's microthrombi and a wonderful example of, uh, of spasm. And so that's why you have this type of uh, uh, feature, you know, that you see on the CMR. Um, so, uh, and I wondered uh, whether some of these uh, may actually reflect uh, underlying changes in the inflammatory milieu uh, in these patients. You know, I know there are some studies that suggest that in fact, you know, the inflammation uh, factor may actually be, uh, um, uh, you know, different in these patients. Uh, so uh, my question is actually, how do you follow these patients? You know, because, uh, you know, there are really fascinating kind of natural history differences as well in these patients, you know, and uh, so, so do you follow some of them more intensely than others? You know, do you actually have even follow up of studies, you know, so this is just a, a practical question. Yeah, we've been following them in the studies, but I also see a number of them in my practice. And I wind up seeing people more frequently, really, if just if they're having chest pain. And otherwise, it is, as you said, it's sort of a, there's a quiescent period, and then there's a critical period. And in the intercritical periods, my experience is that most of these patients are very quiet. And when they're not, I start to suspect spasm more, because I feel like that's what's causing a lot of the episodic chest pain. And your point about inflammation is very well taken. I think that's something we need to study more because after all, all of us probably have small plaques. So why are, and we also know that atherosclerosis progresses through repeated cycles of rupture and healing and most of them are subclinical. So why are these people rising to medical attention when somebody else doesn't even, you know, maybe they feel like they had heartburn for five minutes? I'm not sure. Um, I think the platelet studies are going to be really interesting. The very preliminary data, we thought maybe these patients have hyperactive platelets. They're making huge thrombi, and then they're breaking them down because they're women, and they're accustomed to that from their menstrual cycle. That's probably not it. In fact, the platelet activity is probably higher in the traditional MI patients. So now I'm thinking, maybe you have a small plaque, it ruptures, and some people have a certain amount of platelet activity. They make a minoca because they've got a small thrombus, and it embolizes, or maybe they've got a spasm tendency, so they're showing up. And then other people have a small plaque, it ruptures, they make a big thrombus because they have hyperactive platelets and they're showing up as MI with CAD, maybe even as a plaque erosion, right? There are thrombus aspiration studies that show lots of these patients are non-obstructive once you take the thrombus out. So maybe that's the spectrum. And it's not necessarily that these are the ones that have a hyperthrombotic risk. So inflammation is likely to play a part in that. There's also this um, CT for pericoronary fat attenuation, and it will light up more in patients with Minoka, but also SCAD and also Takasubo syndrome than normals. So I think that's another area of investigation too. Absolutely fascinating. And I know we are running a little bit out of time, but the last two questions, hopefully we can get to them because I think they're important too. And it goes, one of them is actually from one of our uh, dear uh, uh, colleagues and patient partners, Karen Jacques, uh, who joined us from outside of Ottawa today. Um, and in this topic of trying to understand physiology, pathophysiology uh, a little bit better, her question is about what about Cooney syndrome? Uh, Cooney's, not all coronary spasms are Prince metal. Uh, so what's her experience with Cooney syndrome? And then that follows, I think, with a question from Dr. Mike Frosho, one of our interventional colleagues, uh, you know, still within this topic saying, should the goal of Minoka research be making the term obsolete? In other words, figuring out what is the specific mechanism of the cardiac disease in each patient. Yeah, I love that idea. For me, that's exactly what we need to do is we're figuring out that this is just part of the spectrum. The Minoka patients are a little more this way. The obstructive coronary disease patients are a little more that way. Let's just call it what the mechanism is of this MI. So I agree. I really like that idea. This is going to be a temporary phrase, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and then the Kunis syndrome, this is a very well-read person because Kunis syndrome is probably right, quite rare. 
And this is thought to be an allergic reaction that is precipitating um, probably spasm and MI. And apparently the allergens do not have to be the common allergens. So I have sent some of my patients to allergists trying to pinpoint what might be the cause. And I don't think I have really seen a case, but we did see one recently that had hypereosinophilic syndrome. This woman had 20,000 eosinophils for reasons that are unclear. It's often idiopathic and so was hers. And those eosinophils seem to have been degranulating and it's thought that that uh, promotes thrombosis. And she had an in situ thrombus, we think, based on her intracoronary imaging. So um, a lot of interesting overlap with other syndromes uh, that we need to learn more about. For sure. And I think one message about the Cooney syndrome that we have learned is that sometimes the trigger is one of the meds that we use to treat heart disease, such as aspirin. Mm. <laughs> so you know, some women yeah. actually do. Uh, we have seen this, that some women actually do have more chest pain when exposed to aspirin or even nitrates in that category. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I know there are so many other things to ask, uh, but we are running out of time. So uh, Dr. Reynolds, this has been really an amazing uh, time with you today. I think everybody has learned so much. We'd like to thank you for your expertise and opportunity. And now for our trainees that are on the line, uh, I believe there's a different link because you're going to be joining Dr. Reynolds now for a few minutes for some uh, guidance, expertise, sharing of, uh, uh, of uh, guidance and, and some interesting cases. So for the trainees, you'll be joining Dr. Reynolds next uh, in the next room. And then uh, some of you will meet with you again uh, later this morning. So thank you so much. This has been really an enlightening hour with you today. Fantastic. Thanks for the invitation, and I really enjoyed the discussion. Thanks so much. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye.